was the cultural legacy of their Hellenistic and Etruscan ancestors. The Etruscan portrait on the left precedes the Arapaches figure by three centuries. Architecture under Augustus also looks back to classical Greece. At first glance, the Maison Carré at Nîmes looks very much like a small Greek temple. Yet, when you look closely at the Parthenon, many subtle differences are discernible. The front and back are symmetrical, for example, with the freestanding colonnade running majestically around all four sides. On three sides of the Maison Carré, however, the colonnade is reduced to pilasters, columns attached to the wall. This makes the facade of the Roman temple a dramatic and theatrical focal point. Further, the Roman temple is usually part of the urban scene, so it is raised on a high podium to give it emphasis. The Greek temple, on the other hand, doesn't need this architectural emphasis, for it often sits atop raised and sacred ground. The temple is thus an altar in itself, remote and symbolic in function. Not so the Roman temple. In fact, the front porch often served a practical purpose as a political stage for the emperor. This use of the temple is just one example of how the Romans aggrandized the individual. Yet actually, in the age of Augustus, the personality cult of the emperor was still relatively subdued. Stuck off to the left, where the frieze has unfortunately been damaged, he is given no more importance than anyone else in the procession. But 70 years later, in the Arch of Titus, erected to commemorate Titus's conquest of Jerusalem, the emperor is now clearly the hero and intended to be worshipped as such. Although the horses appear in profile, the chariot of Titus on the right is twisted to a three-quarter view in order to show the emperor in full face. By the era of Trajan, at the beginning of the second century, the empire was at the height of its success. Indeed, the age of Trajan has often been likened to the golden age of Pericles in Greece. With its magnificent highway system, the imperial government was able to keep close tabs on her colonies. Again, a symbol of an age devoted to organization. No longer were the landed gentry and the rest of the senatorial class entrusted with important affairs of state. Rather, they were sent to govern the colonies. While a highly skilled and trusted corps of professional politicians surrounded the emperor. As the self-importance of the emperor continued to expand, so did its artistic expression. Here in a relief-covered column which commemorates Trajan's victories over the Dacians, the emperor's self-esteem is on elaborate display. Standing 125 feet high, Trajan's column includes more than 150 separate episodes, in many of which Trajan figures largely. In the Roman tradition, many of the scenes describe the practical, down-to-earth side of life. We see the army building bridges and fortifications, as well as the grim details of battle. Although no attempt is made to suggest space and proportion realistically, the artist's techniques do permit incredibly accurate detail of dress, arms, and equipment. Thus, the historical narrative form proved to be perfectly suited to the typically Roman characteristic of describing their leader's exploits in painstaking detail. 
So as a monument to the original Latin elements in an otherwise second-hand classical culture, the Column of Trajan is unsurpassed. Ancient Rome, the age and its art. Part three, the decline of Rome. By the time of Hadrian, during the early second century, the Romans had accumulated more than 180 holidays. Here is a typical Roman sacrificial ceremony. Originally religious in nature, by now, they were primarily an excuse to hold some form of entertainment. Gladiatorial combats, wild animal hunts, horse races, mock sea battles staged in an amphitheater such as this, and stage shows complete with mimes, musicians, and dancers. The games involving men against beast or other men served a distinct purpose. They helped to distract and channel the emotions of the frustrated Roman citizen who had less and less to do with his government as the empire and the authority of the emperor grew. Emperor Hadrian, however, chose not to use this authority to make further territorial conquests. Instead, he concentrated on Greek philosophy and other studies. He much preferred to have himself portrayed as an allegorical figure in the manner of a Greek hero than as the leader of his troops. Here we see him in a sacrifice to Apollo. Other examples of Hadrian's love of all things Greek are the many Greek ideas he borrowed for his palace at Tivoli. These caryatids, which flanked the pool, are an adaptation of those on the Erechtheum in Athens. Hadrian also built the Temple of Venus and Rome, the only temple in Rome which had the symmetrical ground plan and free-standing colonnade of the classical Greek temple. Copies of famous Greek statues, such as these two of the Doriferous, multiplied rapidly during Hadrian's regime as did portraits of Hadrian and his followers in the guise of Greek gods. Note that this is the first Roman emperor to appear in a beard, a fashion copied from the ancient Greeks. But despite Hadrian's passion for ancient Greece, the building for which he is most famous had little in common with anything which had gone before him, let alone a Greek temple. The Pantheon, whose spectacular dome equals half its height, was and is unique. It represents a brilliant melding of the classical column with the Roman vault. This elaborate interior makes the Pantheon a perfect antithesis to the Greek temple, whose columns and sculpture decorated the exterior, while the interior was relatively simple. With the Roman love of thick concrete walls, the Pantheon is plain, not to say ugly, on the outside, yet highly articulate and theatrical within. The spectator virtually stands inside a piece of geometric sculpture. Art during the reigns of Antoninus and Marcus Aurelius, who followed Hadrian, continued in a Greek-inspired vein perhaps more deeply modeled and naturalistic than comparable Greek works, but essentially classical in feeling. One of the few pieces of sculpture in the round to survive, the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius conveys a monumental, larger-than-life-size feeling. More importantly, it marks the close of an age. <coughs> classical realism and naturalism of the first two centuries of the empire 